for energy and utilities will come to order. Today is Friday, August 21st. Uh, just a few things, members. Uh, first of all, uh, we do not need a quorum as this is an informational hearing only. And uh, just to remind some uh, folks of a few things in an effort to limit feedback and background noise, please remain on mute unless you're speaking. If you have a question or comment, please use the raise your hand feature on the Zoom and I will call on you. And finally, this is an informational hearing only, so no mm -hmm. votes will be taken. Members, today we have one item on the agenda, a discussion with Commissioner, Commissioner Kelly about recent developments at the Department of Commerce. We've offered the commissioner 15 minutes for opening remarks. Members, please hold your questions until he completes his statements. Commissioner Kelly, welcome to the joint hearing of the Commerce and Energy Committees, and uh, please proceed. Thank you very much, Chair Dames and Chair Osmick and members. My name is Steve Kelly, and I am the commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Commerce. I appreciate your time this morning, and I'm looking forward to highlighting my qualifications and the great work of the Commerce Department. You should know a little bit more about me than you can discover by just looking at my resume. My parents raised seven kids. My dad started out as a teacher, but soon switched to selling real estate and later started his own real estate business in Minnetonka. Dad knew it was important to have access to a good bank, so he was one of the founding shareholders of what is now First Minnetonka Citibank. Over the years, mom and dad borrowed money from banks all over Minnesota as they ran businesses in Eden Prairie, Shakopee, Detroit Lakes, Nevis, Ortonville, Park Rapids, and other communities around Minnesota. All my siblings have run or are still running small businesses. They've had to deal with access to health insurance and the costs of other forms of insurance for their businesses. I'm empathetic with the individuals and small businesses that commerce is charged to protect because I have seen the challenges uh, my family has had to face. My wife, Sophie, and I have been married 45 years. She's been a banker most of her career. We have two children, Paul and Eleanor, and four, soon to be five, beautiful grandchildren. I went into law and public service. During my legal career, I specialized in conflicts over complex financial transactions. I worked on cases involving securities and commodities fraud, bank valuations, and employee stock ownership plans, among other subjects. I also did workers' compensation defense for self-insured employers like Ford Motor Company and Whirlpool. All those subjects are relevant to the work that commerce does today. I also became involved in community and public service early. I joined the board of a shelter for survivors of domestic abuse in the <coughs> and served for nine years, including three years chairing the board. Governor Perpich appointed me twice to the Board of Medical Practice. My involvement there led to my nomination as a public member of the Board of Physicians Health Plan as part of the settlement of a lawsuit between the plan and its physicians. After a broad agreement was reached between the PHP, now called Medica Board, and United Health, its management company, I led the negotiating team that created a new management contract between PHP and United. I chaired the subsidiary board that provided services to self-insured employers. Through that work, I developed a more than superficial understanding of the health insurance business. I was elected to the Minnesota House in 1992 and chose to focus my efforts on telecommunications policy. I believed then and believe today that everyone in Minnesota ought to have affordable access to high-speed telecommunications. I worked with legislative colleagues on numerous projects over the years, including telecommunications policy reform, broadband incentives, and health professional licensing. I collaborated with then Representative Tim Pawlenty on Minnesota's internet privacy law, Representative Brad Finstad and Senator Julie Rosen on the Minnesota Twins Ballpark, and with many other colleagues on both sides of the aisle and in both bodies. Other examples include developing a bipartisan budget proposal with Senator Senjum Kirlin, Metzen, and other Republican and DFL legislators in 2005. Working with then Secretary of State Senator Kiffmeyer on electronic property recording. Passing legislation with Senator Westrom to ensure death benefits for the widow of David Day, a St. Louis Park police officer with the Army National Guard who was killed in Iraq. 
passing the original Minnesota Money Transmitters Act with then Representative Dan McElroy and holding a bipartisan, uh, bipartisan town hall meetings with my colleague, Republican Representative Jim Rhodes, um, so that we could hear directly from the constituents we jointly represented. And I'm pleased that Representative Rhodes was willing to write a letter on my behalf. I left the Senate in 2006 and joined the Humphrey School in 2007. One of the projects I worked on there was a bipartisan policy exchange on renewable energy. Senators Senjum, Pratt, Jasinski, Rosen, Paul Anderson, Dibble, Her, Friends, Marty, and Tomasoni have all participated in that learning experience. I was also pleased to invite many legislators to be guest speakers in my classes, including Senators Limmer and Pratt, who are members of these committees. Since I'm before two committees with separate jurisdictions, I'll give a high level overview of the Commerce Department. We like to say the department is with you every day because we really do work with such a broad spectrum of industries that we touch consumers' lives on a daily basis. The department oversees more than 20 regulated industries, ensuring that Minnesota businesses are strong and Minnesota consumers are protected. These range from financial institutions to insurance, gas pumps, grocery scales, and the real estate and mortgage industries. Our mission is to protect the public interest, advocate for Minnesota consumers, ensure a strong, competitive, and fair marketplace, strengthen the state's economic future, and serve as a trusted public resource for consumers and businesses. This mission and the collaboration between the department, regulated industries, and the public we serve is as important as ever as Minnesota confronts the economic and health crises that are occurring simultaneously. I believe ensuring a strong, competitive, and fair marketplace will help protect the public interest, just as I believe that advocating for Minnesota consumers will strengthen the state's economic future. In my role, I've led with a focus on collaboration. While some might not always like the decisions I reach, I've always been willing to listen both to the industries we work with and to consumers. It's important that businesses know that the Commerce Department has been and will be with them as they face the challenges of operating safely during a pandemic navigating business interruptions and rebuilding in the wake of the recent civil unrest. We worked in collaboration with Minnesota's health plans to ensure that Minnesotans could get tested and treated for COVID-19 without copays or deductibles and obtain healthcare through telemedicine. Most other states used bulletins or executive orders. We were able to achieve the same result flexibly by working with the industry. As another example, in March, 2020, I worked alongside Chair Dames to pass legislation giving the department the ability to extend regulatory deadlines and provide relief to regulated industries. This gave Minnesota businesses the ability to focus on the changes to their work without having to worry about losing a license. Since March 30th, using this new emergency response authority developed in direct partnership with the legislature, I've signed over 35 separate regulatory guidances working with industry partners to give them flexibility to adapt to changing circumstances during the pandemic. Our work together in March was a model example of how the legislature and the executive branch working together to provide the flexibility needed to help Minnesotans during this crisis. I've also prioritized working internally with staff and improving the department's communication with regulated industries. Priorities informed in part by legislative feedback particularly from members here today. Within my first weeks at Commerce, I conducted multiple meetings with staff across the department to listen to their feedback and encourage ideas for improvement. For instance, I asked financial institutions to review their examination process and look for ways to streamline services. As a result, regulatory costs for banks and credit unions were reduced. Those were reflected in lower assessment and hourly exam rates for banks and credit unions in fiscal year 2021. We know that's working we, because we now have two credit unions that are, are currently applying to switch from federal to state charter, Firefly Credit Union and Truestone Financial Federal Credit Union. In addition, we're working with a third credit union that is in the early stages of making the switch to a state charter. I've also focused on strengthening the department's engagement with businesses, including regular meetings and check-ins across the industries we regulate. The department actively relies on its bank advisory group 
and credit union advisory group to re provide recommendations and share concerns. In addition, this year we established an advisory group that is informing the agency's work on pharmacy benefit manager rulemaking. When concerns were brought to me by legislators related to the department's market conduct examinations, I met with you, Chair Dames, and industry representatives to hear those concerns and took the initiative to address some of the items where we found an agreement. As a result, Commerce drafted legislation to clarify company rights in market conduct exams. And I have met, though virtually, with the companies involved in these examinations for continued dialogue. Commerce has worked with insurance carriers to improve access to mental health services in the state. My team has been a national leader in crafting the regulatory framework that enforces these laws through our work with the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. We haven't done this work alone, but in partnership with mental health advocates and the health insurance industry. By all reports, the COVID-19 pandemic has only increased the need for access to these mental health services. And we plan to continue our work in this area to ensure Minnesotans have the services they need in order to weather these trying times. In 2019, prior to the holiday shopping season, I issued a ban on off-brand spinning battle toys containing lead and cadmium. This action was in response to an investigation of a Minnesota child's elevated blood levels determined to have originated from these toys. After lab testing confirmed toxic levels of lead and cadmium in the toys, the department worked with the companies to eliminate these toys from their e-commerce websites. This action protected children, not just in Minnesota, but also across the United States. Parents and grandparents looking at toys on the real or virtual shelf shouldn't have to ask themselves which toys might be toxic. In 2020's regular session, I worked with you, Chair Osmick and Chair Waginius, to pass a bipartisan renewable development account bill for the first time since 2017. That included the long stalled Prairie Island Net Zero Project and Senator Housley's Host Communities Grant Bill to help workers and energy plant communities who have recently faced or will be facing utility shutdowns or decommissioning. The RDA uh, law also provides Granite Falls in your district, Chair Dames, with up to $2.75 million, $2 million to replace a hydroelectric turbine and make repairs to the more than 100-year-old uh, dam on the Minnesota River. As I stated earlier, I've made uh, finding opportunities to listen a priority. I have conducted formal government-to-government -government consultation with every federally recognized tribal government in, in Minnesota, all within my first year in office. As a result of consultation and in response to a request from President Larson of the Lower Sioux Community, the department hosted a financial capability roundtable in October of 2019 at Jackpot Junction in Morton, Minnesota. We were happy to have you join us at that event, Chair Dames. In response to concerns that were raised with a high incidence of utility shutoffs on tribal land, the department began working with the PUC to address cooperative and municipal power company shutoffs that affected tribal members, and we initiated a public information and outreach program to tribal staff and residents on how to connect with the PUC to file complaints. I've also put a strong focus on consumer education and services. The department is helping Minnesotans navigate their health insurance on a daily basis, answering questions like, am I covered for COVID-19 testing? And why was I told the test was free, but I received a charge for an office visit? The department regularly issues consumer alerts on a wide variety of issues from banking and investing to energy assistance, mortgage relief, recent telecommunications, settlement rebates and refunds, and insurance. Under my direction, the department has put a focus on financial capability and senior financial fraud prevention. As part of that focus, I created a new position in the department for a senior financial fraud ombudsman. In addition to education and outreach efforts, this position is charged with receiving reports of senior and vulnerable adult financial fraud from banks, credit unions, and the securities industry, and carrying out investigations of the reported activity. From July 2019 through February 2020, the Ombudsman gave over 50 in-person presentations at senior living facilities, senior centers, and senior support organizations on the risks, types, and help for senior financial fraud. The Ombudsman continues to conduct virtual outreach, pre outreach presentations with retirement communities and senior support organizations. 
I'm proud to report that on the very first weekend, the new senior protection bill authored by Senator Housley went into effect in August. Our senior, our senior ombudsman received a report from a Minnesota credit union that resulted in the return of approximately $60,000 to a vulnerable individual. All of these examples speak to the successes of the department under my leadership, which I've led with a focus on collaboration and building consensus. Together, we protect Minnesotans every single day of their lives. We help advance and strengthen the institutions that our citizens put their trust in and their hard-earned dollars into. And we're building a more resilient and prosperous Minnesota. I am eager, well-qualified, and prepared to continue that work. Again, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be here with you this morning. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions the committee may have about my resume, regulatory approach, or other issues. Chair Dames, uh, Chair Dames, I believe you're, you're on mute. Well, thank you, Commissioner Kelly. I apologize for being on mute there. Uh, uh, we appreciate your presentation and I will kind of present the rest of the agenda and kind of a timeline of what we would like to follow. We're gonna talk about some rulemaking and the pharmacy benefit managers legislation, insurance regulation and the data call system, and then workers' compensation. And uh, we plan on taking until about 9.55 discussing those issues. And then at 9.55, we will switch over to energy and we'll talk about energy probably until about 10.15. And then I have some other questions uh, there and then we'll have some questions uh, at the end, some general questions and we plan on wrapping up about 10.30. So to start with, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Senator Cran on the rulemaking, Senator Cran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thanks Commissioner Kelly for being here. Um, one of our most important pieces of legislation that we passed uh, recently was the PBM uh, um, reform. And this, it's an important law for pharmacies and citizens. And, and of course you have the obligation to implement that process through the rulemaking, through the rulemaking um, uh, process we have defined. What, what we're hearing is a variety of challenges that we'd like to address, or at least, at least like to hear your, your thoughts on. Um, it appears to be very limited information um, as far as public postings of the rulemaking documents. They don't appear to be anywhere accessible online. Um, direct communications from a variety of the participants, pharmacies who are attempting to uh, follow the process or to participate in the process, um, their requests go or their, their questions go unanswered from your staff. Um, could you address how, how, you're, how you're taking care of the rulemaking process and and why we're not fighting for um, accessibility and transparency, especially in the light of the challenges we have in the remote. We should be available to more people because of the technology we have available, and it appears that we're less available and it's more restrictive. Could you help me help uh, help us understand that process Mr. and Kelly. what we're going to do to improve it? Uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, to uh, uh, you, uh, uh, Chair Dames and, and Chair Osmick, uh, the formula I'm used to is is to say Mr. Chairman. So I, I hope though, despite the fact that this is a, a joint hearing, it'll be okay if I just lapse back into that habit. And That's refer fine. To Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Senator Corrin, um, as I said in my opening statement, um, in order to advance transparency, um, we uh, created a um, uh, an advisory panel uh, that has met several times and uh, whose advice we used in uh, developing uh, first drafts of um, the rules. So we have made efforts to make sure the process is open. Uh, this is the first time I've heard that uh, pharmacists have not been able to get access to um, the uh, system. I do know that we've received complaints from pharmacists under the, um, under the new law, and those complaints have been referred to our uh, enforcement division for investigation. Regrettably, some of those complaints deal with uh, self-employed insurers um, who, um, because of federal preemption, uh, don't uh, fall under the state's uh, regulatory jurisdiction. Uh, so I don't know if some of the complaints uh, that you've heard about um, relate to some of those issues, 
uh, but we would be happy to address uh, any issues related to access to information because uh, you know, we've done our best to make information public. For example, we recently um, did a data call uh, for information related to the uh, damages from the civil unrest, asking insurance companies to report on claims and how they were doing on paying those claims. Uh, we have put that data- <laughs> Mr. Chair. On the website. Commissioner Kelly. Senator Grant. Commissioner, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The, the, uh, I don't believe that the, uh, the insurance claims for the riots um, have, are related to the uh, PBM rulemaking process or the conversation. So what I'd like to do is, is keep on the, on topic. And so, um, Commissioner, the rulemaking process. Uh, Mr. Um, Chair. We, we get. Uh, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> yes. Uh, 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 Chair Dames, this is uh, Senator Bobby Joe Champion. Yes. Um, I think it would be important for us to have some ground rules here. I think if someone asked a question and the commissioner is answering that question and using examples in order to show that that the department is trying to be transparent and and open, I think that he should have the latitude by which to do that. And members should not be able to just cut off the commissioner um, b because uh, they feel like they want to do that. I just think in all fairness to the commissioner, who's done a wonderful job, he's trying to answer the question in order to make sure that that the department uh, that the committee has a full understanding as to what his department does. Here's the second thing, Mr. Chair, and maybe because I got on a couple minutes late because I was on another Zoom call that you laid some ground rules as it pertains to how this is going to go. I heard the sections that we were going to operate, but it seems as if that it's pre-scripted with others who already have um, uh, some things that they want to put forward, and there is very little room for others to be able to you know, ask questions that would be important. Uh, so, so, Mr. Chair, if you could just caution us in order to, it, to make sure that we're given as much due respect to the commissioner so he can answer the questions, because it sounds like to me that he's trying to be as forthright as possible. Thank uh, you, Mr. Thank Chair. You. Thank you, Senator Champion. Uh, we did lay out uh, the agenda, what we're going to talk about. The data stuff will come on another, in another topic that we're going to be talking about. Uh, as far as other subjects, other than what I've laid out uh, at the end, if there's time, we will get into those other subjects. We do want to go through this stuff first, but I appreciate you bringing this up. And uh, 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 Commissioner Kelly, uh, if you could kind of stay with the questions, I understand where you're going and you'll have an opportunity to speak about the data calls and stuff. And then at the end, Commissioner Kelly, you'll also have a comment to wrap things up and uh, kind of touch up things that maybe you didn't get to talk about. So with that said, uh, if we could move forward. Senator Cran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You uh, and follow up questions. I, I did, and, and it related to the, uh, the the first of your hearing of the complaints, it's unfortunate. Um, it appears that there's multiple people that have attempted to contact the agencies and, uh, and through this process who are critical to understanding the rulemaking process. Um, one of the other pieces in the rulemaking, of course, we, we know it's highly technical, but a lot of it's uh, pharmacies and, and those may not be the highly technical people, pharmacies and citizens who want to participate in the complaint process. And it appears today the way we have the complaint process being designed is that somebody has to formally and technically uh, log into the system to locate a complaint form or to file a complaint. Shouldn't this be a transparent um, process and, and open to all involved citizens? Because this really is about refine a reform law for pharmacies and citizens as it relates to reforming the, the pharmacy benefit manager role. And so it looks like today we, we're looking for somebody to declare and you can understand the concerns of a pharmacy, um, depending on what the complaint is, they could easily be identified um, based on the, uh, on the PBM, based on the type of complaint. So how will, we, how will we make sure that that's open, one, and available to make sure we, we, we preserve anonymity and, and accomplish the goals that this legislation is required or, or desired? Mr. Chair, Senator Horan, first let me say that the department's website has a link to my email address. And I get complaints that don't fit any particular form uh, through that uh, website, through that link on a regular basis. I refer those complaints uh, to the appropriate person in the department for response. 
Um, so there are opportunities for people without going through a form uh, to uh, communicate their concerns to the department. Uh, the use of a form uh, is important for uh, efficiency purposes because um, we are using data to track uh, complaints uh, and to track their progress through our system. And I think that uh, move to using data is a good management tool uh, for the department that enables us to be responsive to citizens' concerns. And I will say that our department takes very seriously the pharmacy benefits manager uh, implementation. Uh, and I, I do wanna say that um, I've held individual meetings with you and with Chair Dames and uh, your uh, staff also has the phone number for my staff. And uh, I don't know when these complaints about how well the process were, uh, was proceeding came in, uh, but I think you know, and I think that everyone on the both Commerce Committee and Energy Committees know um, that all it takes is a call to the department. We've been very responsive in working with legislators. Uh, I also met with Senator Jensen to talk about some of the concerns and with uh, Representative Gruenhagen, I talked about uh, concerns that he had about um, the uh, implementation of the pharmacy benefit manager law. Uh, so I've been very open to meeting with legislators who have heard concerns from constituents. Uh, happy to continue to do that as well. Uh, any other questions from anybody, other senators on rulemaking on that part of the, the hearing? So, um, uh, uh, so, Mr. Chair, uh, you raise your hand, Mr. Ch Senator Champion. Have you raised your hand? Oh, I'm sorry. We're going to follow that hand. process, but I will recognize okay. you, Senator Champion. All right, I would definitely do that. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for that uh, correction there. Um, uh, 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 Commissioner Kelly, uh, can you uh, tell me your vision for the office uh, for the Commerce Department as it relates to? you know, making sure there's transparency, making sure that that the office is being responsive even to the pharmacy benefits manager's law. Um, uh, just talk a, look, a, a little about that because it sounds like to me that you all are trying to be as transparent as possible. And it sounds like you're pretty responsive to not just lawmakers, but also to uh, the regulated and the regulators. So, uh, so, so can you speak a little about that in, in the context of this area that uh, uh, Chair Dames has asked us to, to speak. Commissioner to. Kelly. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Champion, I'll, I'll try to confine my comments to the insurance uh, area generally because that's where the responsibility for pharmacy benefits uh, managers um, lie. Um, I've made an effort to get around the state and, and I, in doing that, I have visited with insurance agents uh, in various parts of Minnesota to listen to the messages that they're hearing, uh, their experiences operating their businesses, and also what they're hearing from their consumers. Um, that's just one way that I've been able or trying to uh, be open to getting feedback from uh, various parts of the industry and from uh, consumers. Uh, the Deputy Commissioner for uh, Insurance, Grace Arnold, comes into the job with a commitment uh, to being open and transparent in um, the work that the insurance division does. And that's why I was using the example of the, um, of the um, data call uh, being data being posted on the department's website. Uh, it's part of that drive for transparency that uh, Deputy Commissioner Arnold brings to her job um, that that example represents. And she has that same uh, commitment um, with respect to the pharmacy benefit manager um, law implementation. Uh, so those are just some examples of the ways that we've tried to be um, open and engaged with the public on the insurance related work that we do. Well, thank you, Commissioner Kelly. I will take one more question, Senator Pratt, and then we'll move to the next area. Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Commissioner Kelly. Um, you know, I was, I was listening to your opening remarks and, and uh, uh, you know, how you view your, your regulated businesses as a constituency, as stakeholders in what you do. And I'd like to go back to some of the work comp discussions that we had last spring when we were talking about uh, frontline worker presumption. Uh, certainly there was some concern about
we've lost you, Senator Pratt. Maybe you need to turn your video off so you come in clear. Sure, thank you. Um, and so, Commissioner Kelly, can you, uh, you had proposed using the uh, work comp reinsurance account or WICRA uh, to cover those costs. Uh, had you discussed that with the insurance industry prior to making that proposal to Senator Dames and I, and before Senator Dames and I brought some representatives from the insurance industry into that discussion? Commissioner Kelly. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Senator Pratt, I don't recall the exact sequence of events, but I do recall that um, very early in those uh, conversations, uh, then Commissioner Lepink and I, uh, did communicate with uh, the, uh, uh, now I forget his title, whether it's president or executive director of the Workers' Compensation Reinsurance Association uh, to talk about um, what we were proposing uh, to do. Uh, and as you know, um, the presumption created additional risks uh, for uh, Minnesota businesses who are both insured uh, for workers' compensation and other businesses that are self-insured. And the department has responsibility for overseeing the risks for both the insurers and the self-insured um, workers' compensation uh, companies. Um, we were concerned about their ability to pay the COVID-19 uh, related claims arising from the presumption. And we also understood from Minnesota Management and Budget that other sources of payment uh, reimbursement for those uh, increased risks were not available. So it struck me uh, that, um, as well as Commissioner Lepping, um, that um, the Workers' Compensation Reinsurance Association was an appropriate uh, uh, place to consider uh, reinsuring the risks being incurred by uh, the uh, insured and self-insured employers uh, arising from that COVID-19 presumption. Senator Pratt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and, and Commissioner Kelly, and I, and I recall that as well. Um, do you recall a discussion around whether or not uh, the WICRA account, if it were to be considered, uh, evaluated like, um, oh, let's say a, a private reinsurance account, that it would be uh, uh, basically undercapitalized and that we had somewhere around $800,000 in claims against that account already. Um, because when, when this idea was first presented to Senator Dames and I, that never came up. And again, I'll ask, were, before you made that proposal to Senator Dames and I, did you connect with any of the stakeholders in the work comp issuing constituency uh, to make sure that they were in agreement that that was a valid source of funds, because I'll also mention that the CARES Act was also a valid source of funds to be used, and WICRA was not the only source that uh, that was available. Commissioner Kelly. Mr. Chairman and uh, Senator Pratt, um, I know we have an ongoing uh, disagreement arising from uh, the determination by Minnesota Management and Budget uh, that CARES Act funding was not an appropriate reimbursement source. I don't think we're going to be able to resolve that uh, in the conversation today. And given that guidance from the um, uh, from the um, uh, from MMB, um, I, I will also say that um, uh, I was first aware of the possibility of using uh, the Workers' Compensation Reasso Reinsurance Association funding uh, from a communication from a representative of, of self-insured. Uh, companies. Uh, and so we, we did not talk. Uh, we did. And now, and my concern is your um, timing of your question related to when we had those consultations. I did have consultations with uh, Bob Johnson from the Insurance Federation of Minnesota on this topic. And I know that um, Mr. Johnson expressed his concerns about it. Um, the consultations that we do don't always lead uh, to agreement on the outcome of what we should do, uh, but it is important to have those consultations. Uh, I also wanna point out, and um, my recollection 
is that the Workers' Compensation Reinsurance Association had about $800 million in reserves for known claims. And over and above that, had $900 million in uh, accumulated capital over and above the reserves for paying claims. And it was that accumulated uh, capital surplus of their specific reserves um, that we were talking with you and others about um, using as the backstop for claims to the self-insured um, and uh, insured uh, employers. Senator Pratt, follow up. Thank you, Commissioner Kelly. And, and I'll say my recollection is much different that, you know, Chair Dames and I were, were presented with a billion dollar uh, reserve in total. And that uh, in consultation with Wicker, we, we identified the extra 800 million that had already been uh, kind of uh, pre-designated for existing claims. But rather than going around and around on this, um, I'll, uh, I'll let somebody else uh, take the question. Uh, other questions on this topic? Seeing none, we'll uh, move to Senator Utke on the data calls and that part of the information. Senator Utke. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Commissioner, um, for joining us. And data calls has come up in our conversations here um, already this morning, and I've got a few questions related to that. Um, in the wake of the riots in Minneapolis and St. Paul, your department has been mandating these data calls from insurers statewide. What are you asking for in these reports? And what is your goal with these reports? Commissioner Kelly. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Senator Utke, um, I became uh, convinced um, that we should uh, ask for information from insurers who uh, might be providing coverage for businesses damaged uh, in that civil unrest um, through participation in a meeting that um, Senator Pratt um, hosted. My recollection is that um, Senator Dames was there and uh, Senator Rosen. I think um, Senator Champion and Senator Hayden were also there, if I remember correctly. Uh, and and there, I, I may not remember everybody who was there, but I, I, to credit uh, Senator Pratt, he was attempting to identify uh, possible solutions, uh, I think with Senator Cohen, um, uh, for um, addressing the losses uh, incurred by uh, those businesses as a result of civil unrest. And in that discussion, it became very clear that it was important to know um, how many of those losses were uh, covered by insurance. Uh, and I uh, expressed in that meeting um, that that was uh, the collecting information from insurance companies uh, was one of the things that we could do. Uh, and uh, following that meeting with um, uh, senators, um, I went back to the department and, wor and worked with our insurance division on issuing a, uh, the data call that you referenced. Uh, in that data call, we're asking for uh, the number of claims received, the dollar amount of claims received, uh, and the claims paid across a broad range of uh, insurance coverage, uh, including personal and um, personal auto and property, uh, as well as business auto and property and other kinds of, of lines of insurance. Um, uh, the companies have been very cooperative um, with that data call. Uh, the initial uh, response came from about 470 insurance companies. Uh, and of those, only about uh, 370 some, roughly, um, had claims. Um, so we asked those that continued to, that did have claims uh, to continue to update us uh, every two weeks on um, the status of the claims they had and the claims that they were paying. Uh, we think it's important to be deliberative, uh, to be data-based. And one of the things we learned through that is that the uh, companies expect to receive or are reserving uh, for um, losses uh, from that civil unrest uh, amounts uh, in approximately $250 million. And so as a result of the data call, we have an estimate of how much might be insured in the face of the various estimates that have been um, 
talked about in the media re uh, related to what the total damages were. I hope that answers the question. Senator Epke. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Commissioner. Um, you, you, you have covered now what you're expecting from these insurers, but an estimate of how, how much time does it take them to do this? Is this something that uh, they have readily available in reports and can pass to you on to you, or are we creating a, uh, um, another paperwork mandate for them? Uh, Mr. Chairman and Senator Rutke, my understanding is that in responding to the initial um, uh, data call, uh, the companies had to um, set up a reporting process in their own data systems uh, to collect data from the, the various uh, uh, records that they had and put it into a digital format that they could send uh, to us. Uh, my understanding also is that now that that um, uh, programming has occurred, um, that uh, it's relatively straightforward to update that. And in fact, uh, in a conversation uh, with uh, Western National Insurance um, that I had um, last week, along with uh, two representatives of the Insurance Federation of Minnesota, we discussed whether um, in order to uh, get better data, we should change the elements of that data call. And they noted to us um, the challenges that might arise in additional uh, record keeping if we did change the elements of the data call. I think we'll be respectful of, of that concern expressed by one of our uh, insurance companies uh, and we'll approach the question of getting appropriate data uh, in a way that's less burdensome. Mr. Chair? Senator Atke. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Commissioner. Um, just to follow up, and you did touch on it briefly because you mentioned, I believe, 470 original insurance companies and 370 or thereabouts are reporting, but we do have a lot of small insure, insurers, insurance companies throughout greater Minnesota. Um, and I understood it, at least at the beginning, they were all getting asked to file these uh, data calls. Have they been now exempted because they would have no uh, insureds in the area of the riots? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Utke, that's Commissioner correct. Kelly. Um, we didn't, um, we didn't make any uh, assumptions about where civil unrest um, damages might have occurred um, during that time period. And so we did issue uh, the data call to everybody, but we made clear um, that if they didn't have any uh, claims responsive to the call, that they didn't have to uh, provide us um, with the biweekly updates. And so that's uh, now um, we have a smaller number of companies that are continuing to report uh, where they are in the claims paying process. Okay, Mr. Chair. Senator Etke. Um, a lot, you know, this seems to be an ongoing thing. Every two weeks, we're expecting these companies to report. At this point, we've got pretty good data on what the total losses probably were, or at least an ex, a good uh, estimate of it. Why are we continuing with these? Um, you know, at this point, I would think, you know, we're dealing with um, all the insurance companies that meet all our requirements and such on an annual basis. Anyhow, at this point, can it dis be discontinued or is this something you plan on carrying on for uh, uh, quite a while into the future? Commissioner Kelly. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Senator Rutke, um, I will note that um, in our conversation with Western National last week, um, the CEO of that company suggested that um, an additional approach that we could take would be to uh, take a snapshot at six months uh, to see where things were, because at that point, uh, if claims were going to be paid, they probably um, would be paid. Um, we're certainly gonna take that advice uh, into uh, consideration as we um, look at this. Um, we also um, have talked about uh, reducing the cadence uh, of reporting uh, from uh, perhaps every two weeks to three weeks or four weeks, but we do think it's important to continue it. You know, one of the, uh, I, I should say that in connection with the, the damage from the civil unrest, our outreach and enforcement teams have had numerous conversations with 
um, representatives of business uh, is businesses in those areas with individual businesses with the legislators um, like Senator Champion and, and um, Senator Hayden um, who represent businesses in those areas. Uh, and um, many of them are unsophisticated. Um, we know that some of them may not have had insurance for all of the claims that they uh, incurred and others may not have had insurance at all. Um, we think it's important if we're going to uh, protect the interest of those Minnesota business owners um, that we know what's happening with respect to the payment of their claims. You know, this is not um, a contest. Uh, if, uh, if people are concerned about that between you know, our consumer protection uh, role on one side and, our, and the importance of our supporting a, a strong insurance industry on the other side, um, this is, these are Minnesota businesses that were damaged in that unrest. And I think it's appropriate for us um, to um, be tracking uh, what's happening in the payment of claims to those small businesses. Mr. Chair? Senator Atkey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, uh, Commissioner, I have one last uh, um, follow-up here, if I may. Um, has your department received um, complaints in, about the insurers in response to the riots? Mr. Chairman and Senator Utke, um, the answer is um, yes. Um, uh, there are uh, complaints under investigation. I can't talk about um, those complaints. Uh, but we also, through our um, outreach uh, efforts, heard um, stories that uh, created concerns uh, about uh, the payment. And to go back to um, Senator Korn's point about um, trying to be open, uh, we think we should be able to collect information from uh, Minnesotans through a variety of means uh, in addition to formal complaints. Uh, and that's why we engaged in active outreach because of the uh, crisis created for these small businesses uh, following the civil unrest. Commissioner Chair? Uh, Senator Utke? I had, uh, after the, with uh, the commissioner's response, I've got one uh, follow-up and then I will be done. Uh, Commissioner, you responded that yes, you have received complaints. Can you give us an idea of how many? Commissioner Kelly. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Corrin, I do not know today the number of complaints we've received from businesses affected by the civil unrest. Commissioner Kelly, would you say it's under 10 or over 10? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, no, because <laughs> For all I know, it could be right at that at that breaking point. Or can you get us that number? Pardon me? Not for today, but can you get us that number and get it to us? Uh, we can, Mr. Chairman, certainly. Thank you. Uh, Senator Utke, do you have any other follow-up? Uh, Mr. Chair, no, I am com I'm complete, so thank you. Uh, Commissioner, I have just a couple of questions for you. Uh, do you believe that insurers should be collecting information on race as part of their underwriting process? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, wanna, I should take a step back since we have members of the joint committees today. Uh, so th uh, the department uh, looks at information from a variety of sources. Uh, and um, we've learned through both our national engagement and uh, information uh, in Minnesota locally um, that in some cases insurance companies uh, can use variables uh, to determine rates um, that um, uh, can result in uh, dis discriminatory pricing effects, uh, including, for example, uh, identifying areas uh, in a community that have higher numbers of people of color and charging those areas uh, higher premiums. Uh, one of the concerns that we have is how do you identify those results uh, so that you can determine whether uh, the company's uh, choice of variables, uh, which may um, lead to these um, results uh, unintentionally, how do we determine um, what to do? Um, some uh, commentators uh, on this subject have advocated that one of the ways to uh, determine whether uh, insurance company conduct um, uh, and pricing uh, is producing discriminatory effects based on race or other 
protected class uh, classes is to uh, collect um, data on those uh, protected classes. Um, the department certainly is aware of those and is considering those, uh, but we've not arrived at uh, a conclusion yet, uh, nor propose to the governor or to the legislature any action with regard to that. Next question, uh, do you believe insurance cost should be based on the estimated risks of the insured or designed to subsidize insureds with higher expected claim cost? Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, um, I think we know that uh, there's been a, a long process um, that has led to systemic um, discrimination against people of, other co uh, of color and other uh, communities of color. Um, for example, uh, Minnesota, uh, and particularly in the Twin Cities, we had affirmative policies of restricting where uh, people of color could live. Um, that has uh, resulted in concentrations of uh, people of color in various communities, as well as in concentrations of low-income people. Uh, in some cases, um, uh, and I don't know because I think it's important for us to continue to study this, uh, but uh, some of those uh, low-income communities are also in older, older homes um, that may have uh, higher risks. Now, we prevent um, insurers from pricing um, based on the age of homes, but other variables could be used um, that lead to uh, a conclusion that uh, people living in those communities um, should pay a higher um, uh, premium. Uh, and one of the risks uh, from that approach is that we'll uh, add to the burdens of people of color um, who've been the victims of system systematic discrimination uh, by charging them higher rates uh, for uh, insurance uh, than um, communities that um, uh, are more white. Uh, so that is an issue that I think we have to study and understand better um, so that we can have a conversation with the legislature about appropriate remedies. Well, thank you, but you really didn't answer either questions, but that's okay, we'll move on. Uh, anybody else have questions in the area of the insurance and stuff? Any other people want to make comments or have questions? We got a few uh, minutes that we could do that. Mr. Chair, I, I did have my hands. hands. Well, Bobby Joe, go ahead. Senator Champion. Just so that we're clear, Mr. Chair, I did raise my hand as And you... I see your hand now, and thank you for that. I appreciate your following the guidelines, and the floor is yours, Senator Champion. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, a couple comments, and then I'll ask the commissioner a question. One is, um, Mr. Chair, is that the commissioner, I thought I answered your question, actually, because what I thought I heard him say was to put it in context is because... Uh, he's looking at the paces and the steps that one should go through or the, the department should go through in order to collect information uh, in order to see if discriminatory practices are occurring or not. He didn't say, yes, there is discrimination. He says that there's anecdotal information and now they're looking for empirical data in order to understand as to what is going on or what is not going on. And so I think he did answer your question uh, and, and in fact, I think he answered them in, in a very respectful way, because as a person of color, I'm glad they're going through the paces and figuring these things out, because we understand, unfortunately, there's been some practices that have been detrimental economically uh, to communities of color. And um, I just think that that's important. Because I am one of the individuals, and I know that Senator Hayden is on the line as well, and there are others, uh, whose community was affected by the civil unrest. I did participate in the meeting uh, with Senator Pratt and others, and Chair Dames, you were there as well. One of the things that became very clear is that we needed as much information as possible in order to determine what, uh, or, or what is the amount of damage that has been incurred. Because if we were gonna ask the legislature or others to step up, and help us deal with the cost that we needed to understand what was going on as far as those who are unsure, excuse me, uninsured, underinsured, and, and uh, those who didn't have any insurance. And so uh, to the commissioner, commissioner, isn't that a, uh, 
a part of what your understanding was from that meeting? And is that what led to you taking some of the uh, steps that you did take in order to make sure that we can get a better sense as to um, the cost and also making sure that those who were insured had their insurance claims at least um, addressed? Commissioner Kelly. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Senator Champion, um, that's absolutely uh, correct. Um, there's, you know, only, I think in order to understand the situation uh, facing um, small businesses and uh, the neighborhoods and communities uh, in the cities that were affected by this, um, we need um, data that comes from multiple uh, angles. And uh, the data that insurance companies can provide about um, uh, their insureds and the claims on an aggregate basis are just one of the windows uh, into understanding uh, the predicament faced by all of those um, businesses that were affected uh, in your community and communities along Lake Street, as well as in St. Paul. Thank you, Commissioner Kelly. Uh, Senator Dibble. Uh, Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was actually going to um, ask for um, some expansion of the very points that Senator Champion just inquired about. Um, but I just want to take the opportunity to um, say that I thought Senator or Commissioner Kelly's uh, response to your questions about um, how to uh, understand data with respect uh, to protected classes was extremely responsive to your input. He didn't answer the question, he answered them the question directly and forthrightly um, and in, in an illuminating fashion. So I disagree with your characterization of his response. Um, you know, uh, uh, I did, I did I mean, we, we spent a lot of time worrying about um, the prerogatives and the discomfort of the insurance companies, but you know, maybe Commissioner Kelly, if you could just uh, expand a tiny bit more, if we can spend another 60 or sec 60 or 120 seconds on, on what you've done and what your agency has done to proactively uh, work out and uh, work, uh, reach out and work uh, directly with the businesses in my district and and further down Lake Street as well as over in St. Paul and up in Senator Champion's district that were affected by uh, civil unrest because we know that um, they're frustrated with um, the fact that they're getting re relatively little coverage uh, from their insurance companies and 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 public resources have not been forthcoming. Um, so so what are you doing to? to reach out to them to understand the nature of their issues and try to come up with solutions. Commissioner Kelly. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Senator Dibble, um, uh, one of the things that I did upon uh, joining the department was to hire a director of uh, outreach and public engagement. Uh, and um, uh, Leah Wilkes has been doing a great job in um, connecting with people and connecting um, representatives are our enforcement division uh, to um, the communities. The enforcement division, uh, I will take a step back. You know, in um, we have a team of people that goes out to communities after natural disasters, say a tornado or a flood, and helps work with um, uh, insureds, uh, typically residential customers, uh, residential insureds, on how to um, uh, protect themselves uh, in those kinds of disasters. Uh, and uh, we talked to them about how to file claims and do those kinds of things. Um, we drew an analogy from those kinds of natural disasters um, to the effects on the businesses and residents in these areas affected by civil unrest. And so we um, converted uh, some of the tips that we um, had for um, the natural disaster situation uh, for um, residential customers um, to uh, tips for business owners and residences uh, in the areas affected by the unrest. We also had them translated into uh, Hmong, uh, Somali, and uh, Spanish in order to expand access for consumers uh, in those areas to the information that the department provides. We also had team members attend an, an in-person meeting with appropriate social distancing um, after the event. And uh, we asked a representative of the insurance agents uh, to be there as well um, so that um, uh, people in those communities, business owners could hear not only from the department, uh, but directly from um, uh, 
the uh, insurance agents about how they approach this. Uh, I think uh, it's fair to say that um, the um, Insurance Federation pointed out to us that maybe we could also have asked if uh, a representative of a company, uh, an adjuster or something could have been there. And I think that was a good comment um, that they've made to us and that we would incorporate into future outreach events uh, in collaboration um, with um, the industry. But we were uh, at that time attempting to bridge um, between agents and uh, business owners who needed the kind of information that an insurance agent uh, could provide. Well, thank you, Commissioner Kelly. And next we're going to go over to the energy side. And so uh, Senator Osmick, if you'd like to go ahead and uh, start with the energy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm gonna keep my video off because I think I'm having some problems with my internet. Commissioner Kelly, uh, very recently, the Department of Commerce uh, appealed the line three decision once again. Um, to to make it to make a uh, to to put it mildly, I was very disappointed. Um, I have questions regarding line three for you today. First, Commissioner Kelly, can you explain to this committee why uh, Enbridge line three is currently running at approximately half capacity? Commissioner Kelly. Um, Mr. Chairman and uh, uh, Senator Osmick, or Mr. Chairman, um, uh, first I want to acknowledge that uh, in my experience um, in the Senate, it's um, uh, not unusual for there to be policy disagreements between uh, commissioners and uh, senators. So I regret the fact that you were uh, disappointed, but uh, I, I don't think it's going to be possible for uh, the department and every member of the legislature or every member of the Senate uh, to be in agreement on all issues. So I, I just want to acknowledge that. Um, and then um, my understanding with respect to uh, the current line three is that it, um, uh, because of its age, um, the, um, I believe it's the Federal Corps of Engineers has advised um, Enbridge that they should um, operate um, line three at uh, less than full capacity uh, in order to reduce risk. Senator Isaac. Thank, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so Commissioner Kelly, it's understood that a 60 year old pipeline that was made or that was put into the ground when technology for coating, anti-corrosives, welding for that matter, is significantly different today than it was 60 years ago. Is that correct? Mr. Chairman, I am not an expert on welding. Kelly. But Commissioner Kelly, you have to admit, I mean, I, you have to admit that we have better technology today with coatings and sealants and, and pipelines themselves based upon our history that a safer option certainly can be put into place for a pipeline in Minnesota today than it was 60 years ago, correct? Comments, uh, Mr. Commissioner Kelly? Mr. Chan, uh, Mr. Chairman, in candor, I'll acknowledge that I have not focused on that because the statute um, that the legislature adopted and a previous governor signed uh, directs our attention to a different issue. And the issue that the statute, that the laws of this state point us to is the question whether um, the proponent of a pipeline has uh, produced a, a long range demand forecast and whether the Public Utilities Commission has evaluated that uh, forecast. Uh, the department's um, appeal is based on our uh, uh, view that um, Enbridge did not submit a long range demand forecast and that the Public Utilities Commission did not have an opportunity to evaluate such a forecast. Senator, Senator Osmond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, Commissioner Kelly, this is about safety. That is one of the components, but now you have led it into exactly where I was, what I was going to ask, because Commissioner Kelly in 2015, the Enbridge filing was deemed complete by the, commission, by the Department of Commerce. In 2017, 
the uh, Congress's testimony did not say one blessed word about the demand forecast or a requirement for the demand, a demand forecast study whatsoever. In 2018, the PUC filing uh, it was completed. And again, there was no mention of a demand forecast required. And in 2018, in June, the oral argument by the Department of Commerce before the PUC did not say one word about a demand forecast. So now, once again, Commissioner Kelly, there has been not one word about a dem demand forecast until rather recently. Can you explain why the Department of Commerce, through the process of this application, did not require upfront the demand forecast and did not bring it up until the 11th hour of this application process? Commissioner Kelly. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Osmick, um, first, just to note that all of the dates that you indicated occurred before I became commissioner of the Department of Commerce. Um, so uh, I can't, in some respects, speak to that timing, and the record will speak for itself on um, those issues. Um, but what I will say is that when I um, joined the department in January of 2019, after the Dayton administration had already made the decision uh, to appeal uh, on uh, the basis of um, the absence of a long-range demand forecast, I did go back and look at portions of the record. And so um, obviously in the end, the record will reflect which one of us is correct. But my recollection from my reading of the record is that the expert um, hired by uh, the department uh, did point out uh, that there was the absence of a long range demand forecast and what um, uh, that expert uh, felt um, would be the appropriate components of a, a long range demand forecast and what issues uh, it should address. Um, that's my recollection from my best effort to understand this matter back in January of 2019. Uh, it is now 16 or 18 months later. Uh, so there could be a lapse in my memory, but um, that is what I recall. Senator Osmond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, it's very interesting you bring up that expert because the expert admitted in testimony that they had never testified on any pr proceedings before about oil markets. So having someone testify, Commissioner, that has no experience necessarily within this, this uh, regulatory jurisdiction makes me very concerned. And second, uh, what your predecessors did, did or didn't do does not necessarily let the Department of Commerce off the hook one blessed minute for what's been happening in this project. I will move on. Uh, Commissioner Kelly, uh, it is well known that this appeal has now gone, uh, has ha now happened twice. The Public Utilities Commission reviewed in, in the light of not having a demand forecast document, uh, they very, very recently on a four to one vote, including two commissioners that Governor Walls has put forth and is on the PUC commission, they, they ruled four to one to move forward with this. They do not, did not have the demand forecast and they are the objective, non-biased, regulatory authority that has jurisdiction over this. But now the commission and you as the commissioner have stepped in once again to ask for a document that the Public Utilities Commission does not deem as necessary in their expert opinion. And I will use the word expert opinion because they are the experts in energy and utilities in this state. They have been appointed to be that arbiter. Can you please explain why the Dep Department of Commerce once again clings to a document and a requirement on the Enbridge 3 pipeline that even the PUC does not see as necessary? Commissioner Kelly. Mr. Chairman, Senator Osmick. First, on the role of the department vis-a-vis -vis the uh, commission. The, you know, the Public Utilities Commission is an independent body that's been given quasi-judicial and quasi-legislative uh, responsibilities by the legislature. The Department of Commerce 
appears before that commission and provides them with expertise. And I will say um, that the uh, department staff, certainly in rate proceedings, as well as in other aspects of certificate of need proceedings, um, does provide expertise um, to the commission. Uh, and my understanding is the commission appreciates um, the expertise in general um, that the department provides to them. So um, I, I do um, I wanna make sure it's understood by members of the committee um, that uh, expertise resides in both the Department of Commerce and the Public Utilities Commission. Um, our responsibility given to us by the legislature is to be an advocate for the public interest. Part of that public interest is carrying out the uh, statutory requirements um, that this uh, legislature um, has put into law. Um, we believe that that's what we're doing by uh, looking at the words of the statute uh, to say, uh, which, which say, I, I, you know, I did not create this requirement, the statute does, uh, that says that the commission shall evaluate a long range demand forecast. Um, that is also in the commission's own rules. Um, so um, we may continue to disagree about this, Senator, but I, I did want to clarify those points. Senator Osmick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll conclude with this statement. Senator, uh, Commissioner Kelly, um, the, the Public Utilities Commission and the Com Department of Commerce vary in one sig very sif significant respect. I understand your point about the demand forecast document. However, that is in their own rules and in their own documentation, and they chose not once, but twice to say that the demand forecast is unnecessary. They did not require it, require it. And again, they are the unbiased, uh, they are the objective observers of policies in Minnesota. The difference between them and the Department of Commerce is the Department of Commerce is a wing of the Walls administration. They are political. They can take political positions. They can submit political based upon their opinion, based upon their political persuasion, whether they think something is right or wrong. But the Public Utilities Commission is completely and totally independent of any jurisdiction. They are, as you said, quasi-governmental of, of, the, of themselves. And it boggles my mind. We've lost you, Dave. Through the Department of Commerce. They want this demand forecast. The Public Utilities Commission, in their August opinion, with their knowledge base and staff, have determined that it is completely and wholly unnecessary. And the Walls administration, which you are a commissioner of, continues to hold to the same old, worn out, answer of that it's in the statutes when the PUC has already said that it is unnecessary. It creates regulatory extensions that to slow or stop this project which are, which are wholly political, wholly political because the objective observers, which is the Public Utilities Commission has deemed this multiple times as in the public best interest. And for, for you as the commissioner, not to acknowledge or at least be part of a solution to deal with this situation that is not playing like a broken record every time on the same bad song bothers me to no end. And it makes me question whether you are in a position that you should be within the administration. I don't expect an answer and I appreciate being able to speak with you today. Thank you. Commissioner Kelly, do you care to respond or if we just move on? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I just one brief response. And uh, Senator Asmick, um, I respect our uh, ability to disagree. Uh, one thing I do want to say in terms of how I carry out my responsibilities as a commissioner is that it is informed by my service in the legislature and also by uh, my um, legal training. You know, my my first uh, class in law school was on um, legislative interpretation. Uh, and uh, and I uh, carry lessons from that class uh, into the work that I did when I was in the legislature, as well as in my job today. And having served in the legislature, I am truly respectful of the role of the legislature in uh, establishing the laws in this state. 
And I am not going to lightly um, draw back from enforcing one of the laws um, that this legislature has passed uh, because of that respect. Um, so I, I appreciate our difference of opinion on this subject, uh, but I do want you to understand that uh, my uh, approach to this is informed by my belief in the role of the legislature in establishing law. Uh, Senator Rarick, uh, you're next. We are getting close to the end of the hearing, so we'll have to shorten our comments up some. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner Kelly, I'm going to continue on a little bit with line three. Um, I represent the people in the north end of my district that are very, very uh, concerned about this and have been working very hard to get this project uh, ready to go. And then I, as a member of the building trades, uh, I also know how important it is to many of the the building trades unions uh, to get this project going, especially now. I mean, I just heard uh, three of the biggest uh, construction companies uh, laid off 100 workers because things are slowing down and they could really use this. And they've been working for years to get this project ready. And, you know, you stated that you're to be an advocate uh, for the public. Um, and I believe you have that opportunity when you testify to the PUC about the projects and I think a lot of the people in the north end of my district and in the building trades would fully expect that some of the environmental groups or others would uh, challenge this. Could you address and answer to them why a state agency uh, would pick a side in this when it, you know, we know it's a contentious issue in, in Minnesota. Um, why is the department using taxpayer money to pick one side to work on and argue on one side of the issue instead of uh, staying neutral and allowing the other groups to do that. Commissioner Kelly. Uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Senator Rarick, um, you know, I think um, every Minnesotan uh, knows uh, uh, someone who's been uh, put out of work or had their hours reduced or had other economic effects as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and so I think that is something that is on everybody's mind. I know it's on the governor's mind as well as my own. Um, so I, I just wanna make sure that, that you understand that and your constituents understand it. Um, uh, the basic answer that I'll give, and I will try to go on, um, is that um, we're charged with responsibilities um, that are uh, set out in statute. And with respect to the certificate of need, in this situation, um, the statute does not ask us to balance jobs um, with um, meeting the statutory requirements. I will say that I've discovered that in my job, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the department is asked to think about um, jobs all the time. Uh, some of the actions we took at the beginning of the pandemic, um, including advising the governor on which businesses to include as uh, critical businesses, a word designed to help keep people working as, as well as to continue to provide services to people in Minnesota. Uh, I will also um, say that, you know, we've worked closely with you on the um, ECO um, bill, the design to improve the conservation improvement program. Uh, and that if we could adopt that, um, that would um, provide job opportunities for people in Minnesota by encouraging utilities to uh, invest uh, in these things, and and I you know thank you for your efforts on that, and I hope that um, if we do have a special session um, in September, that there will be an opportunity to move forward on that bill because of the jobs it will continue, uh, it, it will uh, potentially provide. I also uh, think it's important for your constituents to know that um, the Public Utilities Commission has asked the utilities to identify projects. Um, that could be accelerated, um, that could provide jobs um, uh, in this difficult economic environment. And the department, uh, because of our concern about jobs, is thinking about ways that um, we can um, go beyond uh, providing the, the PUC with our traditional information related to the impact on rates, which we will have to do because the rates people pay are important in this, but we're also trying to figure out ways that we can inform the commission uh, on uh, the job impact of accelerating uh, some of these projects uh, so that they can be better informed about um, uh, how to balance these interests in order to 
um, uh, potentially create job opportunities in Minnesota. Senator Rarick, follow up. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner, I, um, I kind of threw in the jobs just because I heard that, you know, and I know it's important, but I guess my ultimate question is, um, why has the agency picked one side when you said you advocate for the public? And this is an issue that is, you know, many people in the public are on both sides. And with this action, the agency has picked one side. Um, why would you not allow the groups to move forward with this? Why did the agency pick one side uh, to take this action? Commissioner Kelly. Mr. Chairman, Senator Rarick, I respectfully uh, disagree with the characterization um, that what we have picked, what we have chosen to do is to carry out our responsibility to the law, um, to the um, uh, language of the legislation um, this legislature has adopted. Um, forces in society have lined things up regrettably um, so that this uh, comes across as a conflict between environmental advocates uh, and working people who are looking for jobs. Um, the statute um, does not take that side, either side of that. It, the statute that we're looking at is not related to uh, the environment and it's not related to jobs, it's related to whether there's a need for um, an energy facility of this kind. And I think you'd understand with me why this is not just a technical issue, it's important because the costs of these facilities are ultimately paid by consumers. You know, another uh, kind of facility that's included in this statute um, is transmission lines. Uh, and if there's not a, a long range demand forecast that supports the need for a transmission line, uh, then we wouldn't want uh, consumers or ratepayers uh, to pay for the costs of that transmission line in the same way uh, that if there's not a need for um, this, um, for the pipeline, uh, if, the, if the company has not uh, met the standards in the statute for demonstrating that need, we wouldn't want uh, con consumers to have to pay for it. Senator Rarick, quick follow up and then we're gonna move forward. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I would, uh, again, we're gonna have a little bit of disagreement here. I believe a lot of that role belongs with the PUC. They are the ones who help, you know, they review the rate setting cases, uh, they do all that. They have looked through everything on this case. They believed it was right to move forward. Um, so I, I just don't understand this uh, decision. So. Senator Rosen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Commissioner Kelly. I have a, a couple questions and then a couple comments. And I know um, Senator Uckey has, uh, this directly affects his district too. So I'd like to be able to get to him. But uh, Commissioner Kelly, was this appeal your decision? Commissioner Kelly. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Rosen, uh, the statutes put into the Department of Commerce um, the responsibility to um, uh, be the advocate in front of the Public Utilities Commission. We're the party. Uh, so um, the, the decision of, uh, to appeal, the papers don't get filed uh, unless I direct the Attorney General's office, of, office to file the papers. So I'm responsible for the decision. Senator Rosen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Commissioner Kelly, it just, um, it, it, it does seem like there is, the rules of engagement com, are com, totally changing all the time. And that they're, um, you're saying too with this appeal that the PUC did not do their job. And I think that's very disrespectful. I do have my questions and we don't need to answer them right now about this expert that was hired that, um, the department hired. I'd like to know a little bit more about that decision and who this expert is and how much this expert cost and how much the litigation from the department and the attorney general's office um, is going to cost uh, the taxpayers. And if you could give me a, um, a brief summary on that, because um, I, I will be watching this closely. Commissioner Kelly. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Senator Rosen, um, my understanding is that uh, uh, in your role as chair of the finance committee, you did uh, ask this question last year and the committee informed, uh, I believe that Deputy Commissioner Sullivan uh, informed um, you that uh, after um, 
we moved into the appeal phase, um, this, uh, the, the costs of this um, lie with the Attorney General's office, uh, so not with the department. Um, but um, I'd be happy to provide additional information uh, to you. I understand your role as chair of the Finance Committee. Um, I, I disagree with you that the rules of engagement have changed. Uh, the department's been uh, consistent on um, this position, um, and, uh, and so I'm not sure what you're referring to on that uh, when you say that. Mr. Chair. Senator Rosen. Uh, well, I think Senator Osmick, uh, Chair Osmick, uh, clearly stated to you, Commissioner Kelly, that the rules of engagement have changed with the demand forecast requirement, and that is uh, something that is all of a sudden just popping up. So. Um, I'm I'm confused with your comment about not understanding how the rules of engagement have changed. Commissioner Kelly. I don't have any additional comment, uh, Mr. Chairman. Senator Rosen, follow up. Next, we'll go to Senator Utke. Senator Utke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I get my computer here to quit flip, flipping around. But anyhow, uh, Commissioner, um, I think we've had similar discussions a year ago in 2019 about what we probably re referred to as the ill-advised appeals because you first got, you were new on the job and got pulled into one of these um, at the direction of the governor. Um, and now we do it again, I guess. Uh, and most of this will be a statement you can answer if you like. But uh, to me, you know, this is all driven by the, the governor's office, but yet we haven't seen your office um, stand up for what's right or maybe what's wrong, but uh, to you know, put some uh, clarification behind all of this. Uh, you know, we all know the data. Uh, this has been going on for five or six years. The uh, extreme number of public hearings, the uh, amount of pages of uh, documents that have been brought together. Um, but the one thing that's I will finish with, it's important because I sit right here in the heart of this pipeline. The Clearbrook Terminal sits within my district. Um, multiple counties will have this pipeline. We currently have it uh, with the old pipeline and we will even add uh, more with the new rerouted of the uh, replacement line. Um, and this is just so important to our small communities throughout Northern Minnesota. Um, who are suffering, I mean, the whole state is suffering from these executive orders and such that have shut down a lot of our businesses, but in rural Minnesota, it's even worse. A lot of small places uh, will not survive. This would be a tremendous economic boost to our small communities uh, from the number of workers that we all hear about. But when those workers come through, um, they buy food, they're, there's lodging, they're buying supplies. Um, you know, it goes on and on and on. Uh, we've seen that before when a pipeline has gone past our community here in Park Rapids. It, the economic impact to Northern Minnesota right now would be so much, I mean, it, it's needed. Um, there's just no way around it because of what we're experiencing. And if, if this was something that had only been going on for six months, it'd be different, but this has been going on five, six years. I don't think there's anything that hasn't been answered three or four times already. Um, I would just ask that uh, you do what's right and pull out of this appeal and let's get a project moving that's good for Minnesota. Thank you. Commissioner Kelly, would you care to comment? Uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Senator Utke, um, you know, uh, I had an opportunity uh, to serve with uh, many uh, members of um, these committees. And um, my hope is uh, that they recall uh, that in my service as a senator, even if we uh, came at things from a different uh, party perspective or a different uh, approach to things, <laughs> that I was uh, always trying to do what I thought was the right thing to do. I take that approach and whatever reputation I built in the legislature around trying to do the right thing seriously in the work I do at the Department of Commerce, including trying to do the right thing for the people of Minnesota on issues as complicated and challenging and difficult uh, as um, issues related to the Line 3 pipeline. And Senator Atke, I remember um, visiting with you on this topic uh, in your office as I was introducing myself to people. I do know how uh, you um, 
and the people in your district uh, think about um, this pipeline. Uh, I'm not, um, uh, I don't disregard that. Uh, I do have a responsibility to carry out the statute. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, if, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Senator Latz was uh, attempting to participate, but he's got a, uh, an unstable connection. He's up north vacationing with his family. <clears throat> so he just wanted to say that uh, in his view, um, other than the normal tension between regulators and the regulated, they've had no issues or complaints or concerns. Um, and he views uh, Commissioner Kelly as having affirmatively reached out uh, to um, issues around the pandemic to keep communications open and work collaboratively uh, with the regulated industries that they have responsibility for. Um, I think it's to his credit, he thinks it's to his credit that he's not lobbied uh, the GOP or, the, or Senator Gazelka uh, on, him, on himself, on his own behalf. And, um, and in the past, uh, many uh, in your party have, have credited uh, the commissioner with being uh, responsive uh, and working collaboratively as well. I just want to say on, on uh, with respect to these comments on um, the PUC and uh, line three, um, these issues around um, demand forecasts have been around for a number of years. Uh, and um, uh, the, the nature of the comments and the speech we just heard from Senator Utke and others um, are actually asking uh, the commissioner to pick a side and to make a, a decision based on, on politics and, and not the law. Um, uh, he is, he is uh, entrusted with upholding uh, the, the law and the, and the, and the public's interest um, as, as we uh, authorize in the law. Uh, and um, the, the PUC um, and its view is, is not sacrosanct. And I've heard on many occasions uh, members of the majority party complaining about uh, PUC decisions, uh, the nature of the decision, the outcome of the decision, and all the, all the dynamics around uh, the decision that the PUC has made. The process is set forth um, so that the PUC is not a court of law. And in fact, the decisions that the PUC makes um, are, are appealable to the courts. That's the process. Um, and I'll just say that uh, with, my, with respect to myself, I have strenuously disagreed with uh, decisions that Commerce has made, uh, as well as other state agencies. And in fact, uh, challenging laws that that uh, we've, we've uh, passed um, and have been on the losing side of those. It never uh, causes me to question uh, the, uh, the integrity of and the, and the competency and the capacity of the agency nor the commissioner. Um, you know, it, it motivates me to do my job, which is uh, to move and shape public opinion in such that uh, laws can be changed. Likewise with the PUC, um, if we don't like what they're doing, uh, the public has the right to appeal or we have the right as a legislature uh, to change uh, the criteria against which they manage and measure uh, the decisions that, that they make. Uh, line three uh, raises a lot of questions uh, that concern the environment and the public's interest uh, and, uh, and, th and those need to be vetted and tested out against the laws that we set forth around decisions on these matters. We all have our views um, and you know, whether or not they're supported by um, the law is, is really up to us to figure out uh, those dictates and those parameters. Um, and so you know, I think uh, you know, with this, uh, closing, these closing minutes, um, I just wanna uh, say that um, I thought Commissioner Kelly's opening comments and his responses to um, how he has been proactively reaching out uh, to particularly to uh, disaffected and marginalized communities in the aftermath of the civil unrest, of civil unrest, as well as those who are who maybe get the short end of the stick vis-a-vis -vis the, the very very powerful insurance lobby uh, speaks very very well um, to the principles and the and the values and the competence and the capacity he brings to this job. Um, uh, I think I thank you for having this hearing because it really shows what an amazing, uh, incredibly qualified commissioner he is. That being said, I have to say I believe this has been a kangaroo hearing. Uh, you had a list of people you wanted to ask specific uh, curated questions, and uh, you jumped right to them, uh, didn't give really any of us the opportunity, and, and, you're, and you're cutting this hearing short. Um, so clearly, uh, it sounds like decisions have already been made, and uh, you know, no matter what Commissioner Kelly has said, a decision is made uh, somewhere else about what's ultimately going to become of, of this uh, confirmation. So 
um, you know, I just want the public to know that um, Commissioner Kelly has clearly shown himself to be highly qualified. Governor Wallace is to be commended for putting him in this place. Um, and if his, if his confirmation doesn't stand, uh, we'll know that this decision was made somewhere else for other reasons. Governor Pratt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to leave my video off since I had problems with my audio before, but I just wanted to follow up on Senator Rosen's question. Um, Commissioner Kelly, you know, when I, when I go back and look at uh, the PUC's record from May 1st, on page uh, 13, uh, the, the commission says it carefully reviewed the record concluding that denying the certificate of need would not significantly reduce demand for crude oil and therefore not significantly reduce climate change impacts. And then uh, later in the record uh, states that um, on page 16, in weighing the record of the evidence, the commission continues to conclude consequences to society of denying the certificate of need are potentially more dangerous and detrimental than the consequences of granting the certificate of need. So I guess my question, Commissioner, is this is a really big decision. Um, you talked about filing the paperwork, but you really didn't answer Senator Rose's question. Who made the decision to file the appeal? Was it you or the governor or someone else? Commissioner Kelly. Mr. Chairman and uh, Senator Pratt, uh, my answer uh, to Senator Rosen remains the, the same, that the department's ultimately responsible and I'm responsible for the decision. Uh, but as I think as all of you understand, a decision as important as this, I would do in consultation with the governor and the lieutenant governor uh, and, and uh, try to be sure um, that I have their support before uh, taking the action uh, that we took. So the governor did in fact. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, Mr. Chair. So the governor did in fact uh, approve, sign off, uh, concur with your decision to appeal. Commissioner Kelly. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Pratt, if I get a, a chance to choose uh, one of the verbs that you used, I would say concur. Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to know that. Uh, uh, that this, you know, this was a, uh, a decision made at the at the highest level of the administration. Commissioner Kelly, any closing remarks that you would like to make? Uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, members, um, uh, there's a lot uh, more of a story um, that we could tell about um, the work of the Department of Commerce uh, during the time um, that I have been there. Uh, <clears throat> unfortunate to have the chance to work with great people. Every day they work for the people of Minnesota under difficult circumstances that have become more difficult thanks to the COVID-19 pandemic and the fact that they have to work from home in isolation with each other. So I think it's important to recognize that um, though this hearing focuses on me and my decisions, uh, what I've been able to accomplish with the department uh, depends on the work of those people. I respect them. They're doing a great job. And I hope that um, this committee and the legislature uh, recognizes the job they've done during the last 20 months uh, by confirming me as the Commissioner of Commerce. Thank you, Commissioner Kelly. And as I stated earlier, this is an informational hearing only, so there will not be a vote taken I would assume that the vote would have been taken that it probably been to move it forward without recommendation. With that said, members, this concludes the business in front of the joint hearing of the Senate Commerce and Consumer Protection and Energy and Utilities Committee. There being no further business before the committee, we are adjourned.